Steve Souders. I work here at Google on latency, and I'm very excited to have John Resig here today. He lives in Boston, but uh, works for Mozilla. So every once in a while he's out here, and I asked him a few months ago to let me know when he was coming out so we could get him to come to Google and do a tech talk. For people who don't know, John is the creator of jQuery. Uh, he works at Mozilla as a JavaScript evangelist. He's an author. He wrote Pro JavaScript Techniques, techniques and now he's working on uh, Secrets of the JavaScript Ninja. Of the JavaScript Ninja. <laughs> and um, every once in a while I, I get these basking in the warm glow moments at conferences because I'm surrounded by people like John who are at the forefront of web development today. And you can really see how much they're personally putting into the work that they do. And so in addition to his work with Mozilla and Firefox and jQuery, uh, John also works on Firebug, is pretty much leading the Mozilla contributions to Firebug. Uh, he, I think, just is Fire Unit released? Fire Unit just came out. Um, and so we're all in good hands with people like John in the lead. Um, so John, I wanted to present you with this bag of Google goodies. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and then I'll take that away from you so you don't have to hold it. And without any further ado, please help me welcome John Resig. So I want to thank you all for coming out today. Uh, I really appreciate it. So I wanted to talk about uh, a couple things today. Specifically, I wanted to talk about pretty much all the new things that are coming in browsers, in the, the latest releases of browsers. And I wanted to look at all the performance improvements, especially related to uh, JavaScript and the DOM and all the new APIs that are starting to land, you know, trickle down from like HTML5 and the new W3C specs. So uh, a lot of uh, my time lately, uh, at, at least with uh, Mozilla, has been spent working on this uh, performance suite uh, called uh, Dromeo. And this is a, a test suite for doing uh, performance analysis on JavaScript and DOM within a browser. And doing this has really uh, opened my eyes to the issues that uh, browser developers and you know implementers face when they deal with all these um, you know minutia in these APIs. So it's really I find it to be really interesting. So I wanted to talk about some of the upcoming browsers here that are on their way out and should be you know uh, hitting the streets here uh, relatively soon. So uh, there's. Uh, Firefox uh, uh, 3.1 is coming out here in just a little bit, and Safari 4, IE 8, Opera 10, and then the next release of Chrome. Um, but the big thing that is common amongst all these browsers is that they are all actively uh, iterating and rapidly improving their performance. And this is this is just really huge and it's really exciting. It's a great time to be uh, developing. So I wanted to just uh, quickly jot through some of the new big things that are going to be in these browsers coming up. Um, and as I talk about some of these APIs, please, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand uh, so uh, we can uh, cover it a little bit more in depth. But um, so Firefox 3.1, it's currently scheduled to be coming out here uh, pretty soon. Uh, beta 3 is uh, going to be coming out, I think, within just, uh, just the next couple weeks. And uh, but a lot of the big things is that it's going to be much, much faster than Firefox 3. There's a whole new uh, JavaScript engine landing. There's the new uh, video and audio tags, which has been in the, the news recently, and uh, uh, private browsing. Private browsing is uh, another feature that sort of just all browsers are implementing it pretty much simultaneously now. Uh, Safari 4, um, the actual release date isn't quite public yet, but it's pretty much assumed that it's going to be coming out whenever 10.6 uh, comes out. Um, the big things are that it's going to be completely ASA3 compliant. Uh, it's going to be much, much faster, uh, even faster than before. And it's going to have this new concept of being able to deploy web applications to your desktop. You can, uh, I showed you a little menu up here where you can now do a save as web application. You can take a web page and save it to your desktop and then load it up again in sort of a, a quasi-offline mode. A lot of this is going to be made possible by the new 
uh, HTML5 offline uh, portion of the specification, and that's uh, really great in and of itself. IE8 is, uh, this one's also coming out here really soon. They just released the new uh, release candidate. Um, but e even uh, while, while the performance of IE8 doesn't really, uh, let's say, compare to uh, you know, what's happening in, in Firefox and Chrome and uh, WebKit, it's uh, dramatically faster than their uh, previous release of IE7. And uh, at the same time, they are now doing uh, what, what's called uh, process per tab. And uh, this is in, in Chrome as well, but the, the concept that each individual tab is running in a separate process rather than in a thread, like what happens in, uh, in Firefox and uh, WebKit or Safari. Uh, yes? Okay, so the, the question was, it, uh, when Steve looked at it, it looked like it was two processes, one for Chrome, one for all tabs. Um, I'm not sure exactly, at least from what Microsoft has uh, said that they were splitting it uh, up, maybe by splitting up was only splitting twice. Um, uh, I, I know, at least within the case of Chrome, uh, it's de it definitely split uh, per tab. So I, I would not be surprised it's only split twice. Um, Opera 10, uh, the release date for Opera 10 isn't solid yet. Uh, they haven't made any big announcements. A beta uh, just came out recently. Uh, another big, th uh, they are as well are shooting for full ASA 3 compliance and uh, video and audio tag amongst uh, some other APIs. And hopefully a, a new uh, UI skin as well. Um, and then Google Chrome, I'm sure everyone here is well familiar with it. Um, but uh, the the new release here is, uh, should be coming out relatively soon. But the big things, uh, the big thing that it, it it really popularized was this process per tab, um, and uh, this has really helped to change how developers are able to look at web applications. Because uh, right now, browsers generally these they have everything in just a single process. Everything uh, each uh, you know tab. Uh, is split up amongst uh, multiple threads, and they're all handling different things. You know, one might be uh, handling rendering or doing networking. Or in the the problem with that is there's a tendency for a lot of collision to occur. And if one tab is slowing down, consuming a lot of resources, one page is consuming a lot of resources, your other tabs will be blocked. So with this new process per tab model, you start to um, confine everything uh, extremely. So you, what you end up having to do is you sacrifice memory uh, for the benefit of performance. Um, but the, so at the very least, it's, it's uh, resulting in some, uh, you can run some really heavy duty web applications without interfering with whatever else is going on. One thing that I really liked about Chrome though was the fact that um, you could monitor each uh, individual tab and see how much memory and resources each tab was consuming. Uh, they included this uh, this view. It's almost like a, a Windows Task Manager, but within Chrome itself, uh, and uh, that that was very uh, eye-opening because most of web developers have no idea how much their website uh, what their websites are actually you know affecting the outside world. You know they they have no idea if their websites you know me, you know consuming 40 megabytes of RAM or you know 140. And uh, it's it's really important to know that if you want to do something a web application that is actually going to be deployed you know widely. Um, a couple of the other changes that happened here uh, with Chrome, and uh, they changed it such that timers can now run at rates faster than normal. Uh, I know uh, Mike Belshi is, is here, and uh, he is uh, uh, he, he was responsible for this. And but th this is very interesting because typically uh, browsers have a floor for how quickly a timer can run. It's usually around 13 milliseconds or so. How quickly it can it can be called over and over again. What that means is is that it's limiting the number of times, let, let's say, your your frame rate for an animation or uh, you know, number of times to query uh, a particular object or, or what have you. But what happened is, is that now that they've moved into um, 
a process per tab model, you can now give a tab the ability to just check as frequently as it needs to or update the page as frequently as it needs to and without fear of it blocking the resources of the other tabs. So this is really nice because now you can get insanely high frame rates in, in, in Chrome, for example, uh, where you can just do animations at you know, many hundreds of uh, frames per second, which is uh, really quite exciting. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the new uh, JavaScript engines. So there's three new JavaScript engines that are coming out here in uh, or are in various stages of release in uh, WebKit, WebKit Safari, and Firefox, and in Chrome. And there, so Firefox has, um, uh, well, I, I, I should say that all of them are competing very, very heavily at this point. But this is uh, really fantastic, in my opinion, because when these browser vendors all compete and all try to one-up each other and for, for performance, uh, the end result is that users just get a better experience. The users, you know, the pa their users, the pages load faster. You know, developers, their applications will run faster. You know, everyone wins. So it's it's really great, and I hope they uh, keep battling it out uh, indefinitely. But uh, all these engines have a couple common features. Um, at, at this point, they all have uh, virtual machines of some sort, so that they can run some sort of uh, optimized bytecode uh, a, a representation of the JavaScript. And additionally, they also, uh, almost all at this point, do some sort of shaping. So the, uh, looking at objects to determine their general uh, feel and structure and being able to do, uh, be able to do things based upon that. Um, so here's just a sort of rough structure of how the engines currently break down. I mean, the, when you write your JavaScript code, you end up having to, you, it ends up going through multiple steps before uh, finally and eventually executing. But um, the result is, though, is that when these engines are breaking down into this lower, you know, bytecode layer, they're able to optimize uh, their engines much more dramatically and, you know, make tweaks that just unleash performance. I uh, wanted to talk about this a little bit because uh, just just to, to give an example here in uh, just my my pseudo byte code uh, this is not 100% accurate just just to give you an idea so like if you have a very simple operation you know adding uh, two variables together the problem is, is that in, in in JavaScript there is a lot of ambiguity you know uh, it, when you add two variables together you may be concatenating them. Uh, if, if one of them is a string or, you know, if they're numbers, if they're both numbers, you, then you'll be, you'll be adding them. So, and you need to, uh, like, underneath the hood, uh, all of these options are, you know, all these checks are occurring. You know, it's checking for if each variable is a string, and if so, concatenating them together. If it's neither of them is a string, then it's going to add them together. And then within each, you know, concat and add, there's a whole other set of options that have to uh, be executed. But the nice thing uh, is that, uh, they're starting to uh, do some optimization here, so what, what's roughly called shaping, so that you, they can uh, determine if an object is, uh, you know, if it, if it looks like a string and if it probably is a string, then make some assumptions and, and remove some of these checks. So, uh, like, e even, even here, so, like, if, if we were trying to get the, the method property, of, uh, of an object. There are a huge number of checks that have to be done simply before we can even get the, uh, the property, and that's even before e actually executing it. But if we, if we do some sort of uh, shaping, what, all of this code ends up boiling down to a simple, you know, couple pieces of, of bytecode operation, rather than, you know, dozens and dozens of execution, ju you know, just to, ex just to access a single property. So all of this uh, optimization is dramatically improving uh, the performance of, uh, of, of web pages and on, and on uh, test suites. So I just wanted to talk about a little bit about some of the engines uh, in particular. There is uh, TraceMonkey. This is the new engine released by uh, Mozilla, replacing the old engine uh, SpiderMonkey. It's, it's a variation of SpiderMonkey. And this one is... Uh, uses what, what's called tracing technology to optimize 
commonly repeating patterns, like, uh, things that happen again and again. So for example, if you had uh, some loop uh, that was iterating a thousand times and it was calling some function within that loop, what it might do is uh, remove some of the costly bytecode checks that need to occur, you know, and that you're making sure that, you know, that, uh, for example, the letter, you know, the variable i, uh, making sh it's, it's probably going to continue to be a number throughout the lifespan of this loop. So removing, you know, just making assumptions, assuming that i is going to re remain a number, that, um, you know, optimizing, adding one to the, uh, let, uh, to the variable i, um, you know, all of these things. And so that when these loops start to occur and when it starts to go through and iterate back and forth, back and forth, it can start to remove that and optimize it down, especially uh, with inlining some of the function calls. So taking these external functions, pulling the code out of them and essentially inlining them into a single block. So that way it ends up being just so much faster. You know, uh, uh, an empty loop, uh, I remember seeing some numbers for, uh, that the, an, an empty loop running in uh, TraceMonkey was comparable to the speed of an empty loop running in C. Of course, that means pretty much nothing since you're just doing an empty loop. But um, the important part here is that it's trying to strip away as much extraneous stuff as possible, which is uh, really good. So Squirrelfish, um, they, uh, the WebKit team did all sorts of work to get good uh, just-in-time compilation working uh, for their JavaScript engine. And they did a lot of work on their on their bytecode and optimizing their bytecode, and uh, you can especially see this in their uh, in the performance on regular expressions. The regular expression performance is is pretty much insane, and they basically did all sorts of optimization there and ma uh, making that fast. And then uh, Chrome V8, uh, they uh, in this en in their engine they did a lot of work in doing more shaping. Uh, which I, I talked about earlier, but that uh, allowed them to do to, uh, just really fast uh, property lookups on objects. And it, was, uh, and it was really quite impressive when it was released. So there's um, a lot of uh, difficulty in trying to get an accurate measure of performance, trying to understand what exactly makes a piece of job, you know, piece of JavaScript code accurate and representative of JavaScript code as a whole. And especially so, uh, you, know, you know, does optimizing for this piece of code, will it actually help users? So there are a couple test suites right now, each released by uh, the different vendors. And there's the, the SunSpider test suite released by WebKit that includes a number of different uh, tests for testing pure JavaScript. Uh, the V8 benchmark, which is released at the same time as V8, that also includes a number of pure JavaScript tests. Then the Dromeo test that I wrote and released. And this one contains a mix of JavaScript tests and DOM tests. And it actually includes uh, both the SunSpider and V8 benchmarks as well. Uh, just to show some, some numbers, these are uh, outdated at this point. I don't think it would be possible to give you numbers that were even up to date since everything changes every single night. Uh, but the important part here is that um, the performance of old browsers used to be like IE7 level of performance. And like, I, I mean, if you look at the difference between these couple browsers on the, on the left, it's, it's minuscule in comparison. Um, I th yeah, I think these numbers are actually a couple months out of date at this point. But the, uh, I mean, everything has just gotten so dramatically faster in the last couple months even that it's, uh, it's really just blowing away. So this is on the, the Chrome benchmark. Um, it's not completely clear uh, if the, the Chrome guys just happen to be really, really good at their benchmark or if they optimize for the benchmark. But regardless, they do really good on their benchmark. Um, and then on uh, Dromeo as well. And this one, again, this one tests the mixture of JavaScript and uh, DOM. All right, so I wanted to talk about some of the new uh, improvements that are coming uh, outside of uh, JavaScript engines in particular. Uh, Steve Suters uh, released, uh, sitting right there, uh, released an excellent tool uh, for helping uh, browser developers determine what exactly is going on at the, uh, for, for, net, uh, for loading items over the network in browsers. 
and it's uh, his uh, UA tool. I provide the URL there. But this is a, a rough breakdown of the number of features. Uh, he, he breaks it down into an, a number of different categories, uh, which I'll, I'll go into here in a second, and shows how well each browser passes that. Um, for example, for simultaneous uh, connections, so meaning that uh, if you have a number of images in your page, how many you know images can be downloaded simultaneously? So the the, num the higher that number is, you know theoretically, the faster a page is going to be able to load. Um, and you can see the the steps and improvement here. So older browsers, you know Firefox 2, IE 6, IE 7, they all have a maximum connection number of two. But as browsers, you know, start to increase here, you, know, you see it goes up to four in Safari, and then other browsers, you know, Firefox 3 and Opera, all have six to seven uh, connections, uh, simultaneous connections. And uh, I should say simultaneous, connect simultaneous connections per domain. Um, a maximum number of connections is uh, so that, you know, if you have images being loaded from multiple domains, you know, how many can you be doing at a time? And that it, that's really high. So we're talking anywhere from 25 to 60 uh, simultaneous connections. Um, another big thing is being able to download uh, scripts in parallel, so that if you have two scripts on a page and uh, you know they both take you know 200 milliseconds uh, to download over the network, that it won't take 400 seconds total. Instead, it'll just take 200 seconds. Or sorry, 200 milliseconds since they downloaded this simultaneously and then execute back to back. Um, there's another thing that's uh, starting to be implemented more widely. Uh, there's the uh, it's called the defer script, and this is actually going to be in uh, Firefox 3.1. It's an in Internet Explorer and it's also in Opera, and it allows you to say that th that given this script to load it, you know, asynchronously. Uh, and then execute it again, uh, you know, at a later time. It doesn't matter when the script executes. Um, but additionally, there's some properties of a deferred script, like it can still document write, and when the document writes, it, it still does it in the correct location in the document, uh, things like that. So, but when browsers start to uh, to implement this, uh, you're going to be able to put this deferred script on things like ads, and the ads will be uh, loaded, you know, will be deferred loaded and then inject into the document you know, when they're finished loading, as opposed to blocking the entire uh, uh, document load. Another big thing uh, that uh, browsers are getting better at is uh, uh, redirect caching. So every time you access a website, if, there are re if redirects occur from you know, adding in slashes or going to a different a document page, this can, you know, it, it adds up. It's, it's another network request. And uh, some browsers are getting uh, better at this, like uh, Chrome and Firefox. They're caching these redirects so they don't have to be done over and over again. It's, it's, it's a tiny, it's, it's, it seems really tiny, but it's little things like this that really add up. And uh, optimizing these and fixing them uh, can really improve uh, the performance of a web application. So this is uh, a nice new thing. Uh, uh, it's called link prefetching. And it allows you to preload resources on your site. So that you can say, uh, you know, uh, that at some point later on, I'm going to use this image. Uh, you know, you're telling the browser that load this ahead of time, so that the user doesn't have to watch it, you know, load whenever it pops in. Um, so this is something relatively new, and right now it's only implemented in uh, Firefox, but it's uh, it's generally a, a, a much better way. Of, of managing this, as opposed to having to go through JavaScript and use, using JavaScript to manage you know, all this uh, downloading and um, prefetching in the background. All right. Any questions before I keep going on? Yes. So the my question was, how is the performance of uh, JavaScript parse time increased? So right now, uh, the test suites, um, I, I should say, so out of, out of the different test suites, currently only SunSpider tests parse time. But they don't test it separate from actual execution time. It's all clumped together. Um, so it's uh, the, currently, currently no suite analyzes just parse time versus uh, the total you know, execution time. Uh, that is absolutely something that should be analyzed, since you know that affects the initial load. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that you know when that first hit occurs, you've got 200k of JavaScript that that you know gets parsed really fast. Um, 
So it's not completely clear what the best ways of analyzing that are, uh, simply because uh, it, it's not something that can pro that can be easily done in a browser context. You might have to move to a command line context, and at that point, you know, if you're measuring on the command line, you know, is that really a realistic test since you're not in a browser anymore? I, I, it's, there's a lot of questions, but I agree there's there's not a good test there yet. Yes. So it, it just repeat. So is is this you know jitting? Does it you know slow down this initial load? Um, and you know is this cached? So at least in my experience, looking at the numbers, the the jitting does not significantly slow down uh, performance. Uh, at least not in a way that uh, the browser vendor is concerned about, because it ultimately wins much much more later on. Um, but the uh, as far as caching. Uh, as I understand it, the uh, most cache within a page, but not from page to page. You know, it, 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 once you leave a page, you're pretty much done. Uh, it depends how much uh, sharing of a you know execution context there is. Uh, simply because you know, uh, I guess that might be a case where you know the you know a threaded environment might uh, work better since they could all they all know what's going on with the other processes. Um, Yeah, so that uh, so that's another question is uh, you know if you're if you're pulling in obvious something that's obviously an identical piece of code every single time you know uh, jQuery or Dojo YUI you know it's um, uh, you know if if there was a way to send down you know a straight bytecode you know to say hey here's the lowest level you can get but at the same time that would require that all the browsers you know standardize in a single bytecode and they're having a hard enough time standardizing on just JavaScript so I mean we'll see um, yep. I, I couldn't say. I, I I wouldn't feel comfortable giving a good estimate um, until I had good data. I mean, it, yeah, the at least for, you know this parse time is, mm, you know, at, at least for right now, at best, it's just clumped in with execution time. Um, Um, so, uh, yeah. So the, the question was, you know, if if it's found out that you know parse time is a significant burden, um, you know, that that's something that should be optimized. Uh, you know, I, I assume that if if there if if, some, if solid numbers come out for all the major JavaScript engines, you better believe that you know the browsers are going to be working to optimize that number. Um, for for developers, I'm not sure. I, I mean, and again, that that's another case where uh, better tooling. Would help, uh, you know, to answer those questions. Yes. Could you repeat the question for the remote sites? 
Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. When, when he's done. Okay, so uh, just, just to repeat, so the uh, vast, at, at this point with the new engines, the vast majority of time isn't spent parsing. In fact, very little time is spent parsing. And uh, that these new engines are trying to be as just fundamentally lazy as possible to try and break parsing out later and worry about everything later. And so, I mean, there, there may be an initial hit, but it definitely isn't, uh, you know, a, a massive hit, uh, at least not compa in comparison to old engines. So just that, uh, that you know, it, yeah, right. So the, the initial parsing in, in you know, it, it, in, in, you know, in chatting is, isn't um, free, but, you know, the ultimate win you get is, you know, pretty awesome. So, okay, any other questions? All right. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the communication layer, some new communication APIs that are landing. Um, one of the ones that's actually being implemented quite widely is a, a post message. This uh, method allows you to, uh, it exists on uh, Windows, and allows you to communicate uh, from a win one window to another. So like from a page to an iframe, uh, you know, iframe to a parent page, from, you know, uh, things of that nature. But what's so good about it is that it works cross domain. It doesn't matter, you know, if the frames are owned by different domains. Um, so, for example, if you had an iframe in your page, you could send it a, a text message, you know, test or what have you, and um, a, a URL. The URL specifies, um, you're, you're saying, send this message to this iframe only if, it, you know, it matches this, uh, this URL. Uh, the, the iframe then would then listen for messages that get passed into it from a post message. And so it listens for a message event. And, and then verifies the origin of the incoming message. You know, make sure that the message is coming from a domain that it trusts. And if not, you know, just stops doing whatever it was going to do. But otherwise, you know, uses the data that, that's coming in. So using, using post message, you can implement all sorts of interesting things. Um, in some personal experiments of mine, I've used post message to implement, you know, a cross-domain uh, XML HTTP request. Because you it, you just insert a little iframe and you start doing communication back and forth, and it becomes you know uh, very usable. So it, it, this is a, I think a very interesting new API. Uh, there's uh, there's there's true uh, cross domain XML HTTP requests. This is using the uh, W3C access control uh, API, and if on uh, so what what you do is you use XML HTTP requests as normal, and you would try to request a remote uh, document, it, it verifies if uh, certain headers are in place that uh, will that allow this, you know, a piece of you know, XML, HTML, what have you, to be requested. So in the case of uh, the access control, you can specify, for example, access control allow origin, and then you can specify a single URL, so say, you know, only allow things to come from Google, only allow requests to come from Google, or in this case, star, allow requests to come from everywhere. Um, and you can, you can really you know, filter down this way. So what's interesting is that um, this new access control specification is um, starting to be used like everywhere uh, within, you know, within the specifications and within um, HTML5. And it's very likely that, or uh, there's still a lot of debate, I should say, over whether or not uh, this should be uh, specified for like audio and video tags, so that if you want to include a remote uh, video, that you know doesn't have to have these headers to allow uh, you to access that video. Uh, it's not really clear at this point. Uh, so yeah, yeah, this is this is the uh, this is the response header, correct? So in this case, you, yeah, if you had uh, an HTML page on a remote domain it, and you tacked on that extra header, uh, you would be able to. Uh, you know, any any browser that supported this cross domain XHR would be able to request it. Yep. 
Um, there's some uh, decent improvements coming in DOM navigation. Uh, one of the early ones to land was uh, get elements by class name, uh, you know, allowing you to uh, find all sorts of, you know, find elements on a page that have a specified class. Uh, this is in uh, some current browsers, Safari 3, uh, 1, uh, uh, Firefox 3, and uh, Opera 9.6. Uh, we just found a bug just the other day in Opera's implementation. It's uh, unable to find um, actually, this example here doesn't work in Opera 9.6. Uh, it's not able to find the second class and a class name uh, for whatever reason. It can only find the first one. Um, so, yeah, it's still a work in progress. Um, but, yeah, but at the very least, it's, it's very fast. It's, it's way, way faster, uh, just to show you. So, like, on, on the left, on the right here, we have some old school methods, just pure JavaScript DOM. Uh, we have an XPath implementation, but then there's the native get elements with class name, and it's a, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the, the normal cost. And so because of that, you know, JavaScript frameworks that take advantage of it are instantly sp uh, sped up. And, it, you know, using it in your code is, uh, you know, it's a huge win. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about now uh, is the new selectors API. This is um, the, uh, the W3C specification, uh, selectors API specification, and it gives you uh, new methods for finding elements on a page using um, uh, CSS selectors. And so it not, it, the, it, it's good because you get the best of both worlds. You get an intuitive syntax. You know, developers are already familiar with CSS uh, rules, you know, for how they match elements. And, you know, at the same time, you get this, you know, crazy, crazy speed. Um, I, but I, I'm really excited by the fact that it's everyone's implementing it. Uh, it's implemented in IE8, uh, Opera 10, uh, it's going to be in uh, Firefox 3.1, and Safari 4. It's just, it's, it's everywhere. And I'm really excited by that. Um, just to show you some performance, on the left here we have some traditional JavaScript libraries that are just using regular, you know, uh, JavaScript query, you know, JavaScript DOM. And then on the right is, uh, you know, query selector all. And it's uh, a tenth, uh, you know, it you know it's ten times faster than the next uh, closest library. Of course, all the libraries now are adopting query selector all, since it makes a ton of sense to. Um, so that's going to be uh, really great. Uh, one of the new ones, uh, specifications that are that's just finishing up and starting to land in browsers is, is called the Traversal API. Um, this is, a, again, this is a, a W3C specification. Uh, it's implemented in Firefox 3.1, but it gives you a couple methods that you can use to make uh, navigating around uh, a DOM document easier. It, it roughly, it, it makes it so that you can access el you know, element siblings. Um, and because traditionally, it, there's, uh, if you access, you know, first child or last child or, you know, what have you, uh, you'll get, you could get a comment node, you could get a text node, you can get any number of these things. And um, when a lot of the time developers just want to get the elements that are there, since that, that's what's usually what's visible. Um, so those four things are, are in the specification, they just landed in Firefox 3.1. But one of the things that's unrelated to that specification um, is dot children. This was uh, something that was originally in Internet Explorer. But it is it is now implemented in every browser. Uh, every browser uh, now implements it and allows you to get only the child elements of um, a parent element. And so, I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, having dot children around kind of uh, removes the need for this new specification. But uh, the nice thing is that uh, in Firefox 3.1, they actually implement dot children. So now it'll be absolutely everywhere. All right, so uh, drag and drop. There's uh, some browsers are actually starting to implement the HTML5 style of drag and drop. There's uh, you get all sorts of messages to indicate, uh, you know, events to indicate when dragging is occurring, starting and stopping, and you can you can hook into this and transfer data from you know different points in the document. It's 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 pretty cool um, and something that really should have been done a long time ago. Um, so we're starting to see this now uh, start to land in browsers. But in the meantime, we're kind of stuck uh, since you know, not everyone implements it yet. But in the meantime, we can use uh, get bounding client rect. This is a method that is starting to get uh, implemented more. This is uh, an Internet Explorer method uh, historically. 
and it's starting to get implemented more in more browsers. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to find, uh, get a pretty accurate representation of the position of an element in a document. And when you're doing drag and drop, you need to determine pretty accurately where that element is currently located so that you can move it accurately and so that you can position it uh, well. And so this is, you know, it's really fast and it's starting to get implemented more, which is uh, awesome. Um, another great thing that's, uh, that I'm really excited about is uh, the inclusion of uh, threading in JavaScript. This is just starting uh, to come out here, and it's, it's really, really exciting to see this uh, land. So what, what, what it's called, it's called, um, it's called a web workers, and it, it's not threading in the true sense, but what you can do is you can spawn uh, scripts that can run in the background, and you can communicate with them um, in, you know, using a message passing. So just to show you a, a simple example, here we have uh, uh, a script being loaded in externally. So in this case, it loads in the my worker uh, job, uh, script file and executes it in the background. And then at the same time, whenever the, whenever the worker is done executing, a message will get passed back to the on message callback. So that you so you can start to communicate uh, back and forth with uh, you know, these scripts that are getting loaded in these uh, 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 workers. Just wanted to show an example. So this is done uh, uh, by Oliver Hunt. Uh, he's on the uh, uh, WebKit uh, Squirrelfish team. And he built a, a ray tracer in uh, JavaScript. So I wanna, I'm just going to disable this. So right now, it's, just, it's using the canvas element to draw. Uh, if we run this, we can see it uh, truck along. This, so this is just you know, you know, regular JavaScript communicating with canvas, uh, you know, doing all the calculation and uh, drawing everything out. It takes... It takes a while. It's, it's it is uh, you know e even even in, in the, this right here. This is uh, uh, Safari Nightly. Um, I mean, it's it's still going to take I'd say about you know 15 20 seconds to run. So once that finishes, okay, 27 seconds. All right. So let's reload and let's add in a couple worker threads. So what what that's going to do is going to break apart different portions of the image to render, send it to each of the workers, and then when they're done, it'll report back and draw them. So let's run this now. There we go. It, now all the worker threads is it ended it in three and a half seconds, uh, so almost ten times faster. And that was with only four worker threads. Uh, we could probably up that a little bit. Figure, figure out a sweet spot. Uh -huh. So what? I don't know. Uh, it, 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 is it because of a set timeout or something? Not sure. I, I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure what the like. I was talking with him before about his implementation about why you know. Uh, well, I guess here I guess we could we could go down to one worker thread. Uh, well, we can't really see it. That's not exciting. Hang on. So yeah, my guess is maybe just the other implementation he had was just bad, maybe. But I, I mean, but e so even so, using one worker thread, uh, you know, it took six and a half se uh, seconds. Four worker threads was able to speed it up to, you know, three and a half. So I, I mean, there's there's a definite room for speed up. There, unfortunately, there are a lot of gotchas with this new uh, worker thread stuff. Uh, one of which is that when you pass uh, messages to um, uh, 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 one of these workers. It has to be as a string. Uh, a nice thing, though, is I'm, I'm glad they started to do this, that if you pass in uh, a JavaScript object, it'll serialize it as JSON and then deserialize it again. So the important thing here is that yeah, they wanted to make sure that there, were, you know, there could be no information leak, you know, it, no, uh, no access to external you know, windows or you know, anything that uh, uh, an inner thread shouldn't have access to. And additionally, uh, these inner threads have a really limited um, uh, existence, let's say. Uh, you know, they, they only have access to basic JavaScript. They don't have access to the DOM. They don't have access to Canvas. They don't have access to any of this stuff. So in the case of these, um, these threads here, what's really happening is they're probably just pushing around you know, matrices of numbers. 
Um, uh, and, and then the, the, the main th thread, the one in the window, is just, um, you know, is the one that's actually doing the rendering to the canvas. So I, ho I definitely hope that some, uh, at some point we'll be able to pass around uh, uh, canvas objects. Uh, you know, and pa pass a canvas object to a thread, uh, a worker, and then have it come back with uh, some results. That'd be really awesome. Uh, any questions on the worker thread stuff? Really quick. Okay, so there are um, a lot of different, um, I guess, uh, CSS-related things that are, that have started to uh, get implemented, and uh, you know, these are different just. Uh, stylings and, and effects you can apply to your site, but the, while they don't provide, you know, an, an immediate obvious, you know, JavaScripty uh, performance boost, what what they do is they allow you to dramatically simplify your markup and remove all sorts of, you know, cruft that you, may, you won't have to deal with anymore. Uh, one of the uh, popular ones is uh, one of the ones that was implemented really early was the ability to do uh, rounded corners. Traditionally, in order to do rounded corners, either required loading in extra images to represent the corners, or doing all sorts of really nasty hacks with lots of little divs you know, uh, being spaced around. Um, and in either way, the old methods were not good. Um, but with the new CSS properties, you can just um, add in quarters you know, as part of your style sheet. Um, there's also the concept of uh, shadows. Um, both uh, having shadows on text, uh, so a drop shadow, but ha being able to have shadows around arbitrary elements. So, you know, if you have a div uh, that's supposed to be hovering somewhere on the page, you can actually put a drop shadow behind it now and ha you know, give that uh, extra appearance. And uh, this is implemented both in uh, WebKit and Firefox. Um, let's see, I'm going to show, I'll jump back to the examples here real quick. But the... Um, uh, there's also the ability to load in uh, custom fonts. So uh, right now, most solutions for loading in fonts are usually, you know, flash-based, uh, like a sort of like, like there's a Cipher and other ones of that nature, and they load in a font file and render it in a in a, fl a flash uh, context. But uh, what's starting to happen is actually getting some good font sub custom font support in CSS. Let me see. Oh, and then uh, before I jump to the demo, the uh, there's also a new transformations and animations starting to land. So uh, WebKit has been really pushing forward here, uh, starting to land all sorts of new uh, ways to do animations from CSS, so no JavaScript involved whatsoever, and it's uh, really quite exciting. So let me show some of these demos here. Uh, this is an example of the box shadow. So these are just normal... Uh, little divs, you know, you can resize it, and the the shadows persist. And these are all just styled uh, with this uh, box shadow property. Here we have a uh, text shadow. <laughs> so this guy made uh, a hilarious uh, demo page of things that you should not do with text shadow. Um, and so he animated the text shadows, um, and so added a fire style. I like that one. Um, yeah, and, you know, he showed all sorts of ways. You know, using shadows, you can get things that look like they've been, you know, embossed or uh, things of that nature. Um, there's uh, also the concept of uh, transformations. Uh, so, in this case, uh, these are set to animate when uh, I move my mouse over and then start to transform an element. Um, so, you transform by position. This is all CSS. There's no JavaScript. Um, rotate. Um, uh, grow in size, and then you can also combine properties. So in this case, it's actually animating rounded corners, color, and size all at the same time. Um, yeah, so it, it, can, it can get you know, pretty uh, exciting. I'm, I'm sure that'll be abused in many, many ways. Um, and then here's an example using a, a custom a loaded fonts. Uh, so you can see this is actual, you know, real text here. And it's all being styled using uh, true type fonts uh, that were dynamically loaded in. Let me see if I can hard reload here so you can see the. Oh yeah, so I get, it, yeah, it just gets all pulled in there. Um, okay. Uh, one of the things that I've been most excited about lately uh, that's uh, been 
getting really good support in browsers has been the new uh, HTML5 canvas element. And this new element uh, allows, essentially gives you a, a, a 2D uh, 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 just box in which you can draw, uh, you know, arbitrary, you know, shapes and, you know, pixels and, and what have you. But it gives you a ton of power to be able to actually draw on a web page. And uh, the number of the things that people have been doing with it are really uh, quite fantastic. Uh, there's also a library that was produced here at Google uh, called XCanvas that allows you to use Canvas in other browsers. Or sorry, use Canvas in browsers that don't support it like uh, Internet Explorer. Unfortunately, it doesn't support some of the new APIs like being able to do work with uh, 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 matrices of pixels and things of that nature. Um, I wanted to show a quick demo. Uh, I released uh, early, uh, early last year uh, something I ported the the processing uh, visualization language that was it's a it's a Java a language implemented in Java and allows you to do all sorts of visualizations. I ported it to uh, JavaScript running inside of a canvas. And I wanted to show some uh, examples here. Um, this is a simple one. So this is uh, just uh, doing some, it's basic collision detection um, and multiple objects being rendered. It's all in real time in a canvas element, you know, using JavaScript. Uh, let's see here. Um, so uh, this one is actually, oops, it's scanning the pixels of an image and rendering out the different, it's going by pixel by pixel through an image that's loaded into a canvas and uh, drawing out the pixels of it. Uh, let's see. And we can, we can, you can actually see where exactly in the image it's currently uh, pulling from. Um, let's see here. I like this one. This is a, a flock of birds. So uh, this is, you can really start to see the performance of these JavaScript engines. So it's doing all the computation to figure out how the birds should be flocking together and then rendering them uh, simultaneously to uh, the canvas. Um, I like this one too. This is a sort of a, a blobby shape that you can, you can play around with. Uh, yeah, I just have way too much fun with this stuff. But I, I love Canvas. I think it, I think it's definitely uh, one of the best things to come out uh, in, in web development as a whole. Uh, just showing you some examples of what things you can do with Canvas. Uh, it, it gives you the it, the important thing to realize is that Canvas is not SVG. You're not dealing with vectors, and you you can't you know mutate shapes once you draw them. Everything it's you can think of it like you know Microsoft Paint. You put it down, it's there. And the only way to get rid of it is to draw on top of it. <laughs> so uh, you're constantly just, um, you know, you, you have a, a, some basic primitives. You can draw you know, rectangles and circles and, you know, things of that nature. Um, and then uh, when you draw, you can, uh, you're given a, a series of fills and strokes. So you can, you can fill a rectangle with a color, set a stroke on the, out, you know, outline, uh, things like that. Yes. Yep. Okay, so the... Uh, the thing that's nice about Canvas, though, is that it behaves just like a normal HTML element. You can embed it straight in line. You know, it 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 it, uh, uh, re uh, it, it handles z-index properly, opacity. You know, it, it behaves completely normal. So I've seen cases where people have used canvases to do things like drop shadows or rounded corners. You know, it, it, for browsers that don't have them, uh, being able to you know draw custom uh, backgrounds and you know, all sorts of things dynamically. Uh, I've even seen cases where someone has drawn. Um, uh, custom UI widgets using uh, Canvas elements. There, there's really a lot of possibilities. Um, canvases themselves can consume images, so you can port an image into a canvas. Uh, and, and additionally, in Firefox 3 and Safari 4, which have the, the video element, you'll be able to take a frame of a video and put it in a Canvas element and manipulate it. So that, that'll be uh, pretty exciting. Um, one of the things that's uh, also seeing uh, a lot of play is the ability to have better control over data on the client side. And one of the big things has been uh, the introduction of some sort of SQL storage on the client side. And uh, this, is, this was introduced in HTML5, and it's, it was implemented in uh, WebKit. It gives you a full database, so you can create a database for a website and then run SQL queries against it. It's actually just a, a SQLite implementation running in the background. 
uh, wanted to show an example. Just the other day, uh, Brandon Aaron, uh, contributor to jQuery, he wrote uh, a little API browser. This is actually for the iPhone, but uh, you, so you can browse through the API and you can uh, view methods and whatnot. But all of this information was actually loaded up in the background and it was actually stored in a database. So if you look here, so, uh, and this is in the, the console, you can see the database and here's, uh, let's see, here we go. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, just, it's, it's just a SQL database. So, I mean, uh, and you can, you can go through and see everything that's powering uh, the website. It, additionally, this is, so this actually works on the iPhone as well. So in this case, when you first loaded the application on the iPhone, it would download all the data, store it in a SQL database on the iPhone, uh, so that it would, it would be able to load faster in the future. And then, uh, and then also there's the uh, native JSON uh, support is starting to land in uh, JavaScript engines. So this is giving you the ability to parse JSON and be able to convert JSON or a, a JavaScript object to a string in a, you know, just very, very quickly. So I want to show you um, the, the performance breakdown. We, uh, the, the yellow and purple lines are traditional uh, uh, types of parsing uh, JSON. Uh, or I should say encoding and then decoding, and the red line with the one that has you know virtually no uh, you know uh, spike to it is is the native one. So it's dramatically faster. It's really quite excellent. So I think I'm running out of time. So I just want to uh, quickly open up uh, for questions at this point. If uh, anyone has any questions about uh, what I talked about today. So um, the, the, the question was, you know, is it, does it make sense to uh, provide a, you know, a strict mode that will make it easier for uh, you know, uh, interpreters to analyze, um, especially when the context of JavaScript libraries? Um, I'm not completely sold on it. I mean, the, the, the whole reason uh, for like a lot of the old you know, ECMAScript 4 stuff was that there was a huge assumption that you weren't going to be able to make JavaScript fast. Because JavaScript was, you know, it's a weird language. It isn't, stat, you know, statically typed. You know, it's, um, and because of those, in, and so they added things like classes and, and types and all sorts of things. And then they found out that, hey, we can make JavaScript fast. In fact, we can make JavaScript really fast. Uh, so I'm not really sold on there being restrictions to the language, um, especially since, you know, current browsers seem to be doing just fine anyway. Um, I think it'll only just limit what you can do. Other question? Um, so, it, so he was saying that, you know, there's, that the performance is getting much faster, but the tools that we have for understanding it just aren't there yet. Um, so, you know, w w what's available? So, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult at this moment. I think one of the big things going forward is that we have to be able to give developers more information about, to start, how much CPU and memory their sites are using in all browsers, not just... Uh, Chrome or you know whatever browsers are particularly blessed. Uh, I would say it's it's much more important that browsers in browsers that leak memory badly um, 
and so it, you know being able to have good tools there so that we can we can better understand how to write let's just say acceptable web applications right uh, we'll be able to we'll be able to I think expand a lot better uh, from there yeah how aggressively are web developers going to be able to take advantage of all these new capabilities and still have this tale of legacy like mm -hmm. either how long will we have to wait or are there ways people are deciding you know we're going to start not supporting other browsers or mm -hmm. other services but otherwise it's very tantalizing but mm -hmm. it's like kind of main things that really use this stuff in the next while so um your question is, you know, you know, how much can a site really start using these? So uh, the, the ones that I picked today are all ones that can be used in some context. And, I mean, obviously, it, um, it, it, it isn't an, an all or nothing situation. So for example, uh, the worker thread, you know, the, the web workers, you know, you can, you can write one that works now. You know, it draws, it draws very slowly, but it draws. Um, or you could you you could just you could, it's literally just a drop in and you can just start to use threads and get a better performance, and so I think there's a lot of cases you know uh, uh, workers you know get elements by class name, uh, being able to do uh, you know the query selector all uh, all that stuff, uh, not only does it make yourself faster in a very simple way, but um, since it's just, it's just JavaScript you can just detect to see if it exists and if it exists do your fast thing if not do your slow thing, um, so I think I think there's uh, there's absolutely room for being able to do all this now, uh, and I think it's really important for developers to, to be able to start to do that because if they're able to show that you know newer browsers not only are faster but just you know light years ahead in performance, um, you know they'll be able to get users of you know IE6 